morning. Can I ask if we can stand together? Thank you so much for joining us today as we remember the most significant day in the history of mankind. Today we celebrate an event where literally the Lord Jesus looked at the cross. We see that from Isaiah 53. And then turns to you and says to you, you're worth it. And goes to the cross. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, you're worth it. As we worship the Lord together today, you'll notice there's communion elements right around the room. We want to take communion today at the end of the service. Please be careful. Don't sit on it and don't stand on it in case it spills over. Also, during the service, we're going to show pictures from the Passion, the Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson. Can I ask you, when we do, if your children are sensitive or you're a sensitive viewer, just to close your eyes and allow the visuals to flow. Because sometimes I think we take crucifixion too lightly. And today we want to remember the price that Jesus paid for us. Can I ask if we can bow our heads? And Father, we thank you for sending your son for us. Thank you that you deemed us worth it. That you could save us, a wretch like us. Father, that you would reach down and pull us out of the pit and lift us up onto your shoulders that we could be seated in the heavenly places in Christ. And so this morning, Father, we come before you and we worship you because you are worthy of worship, of honor and glory. And we speak a blessing of our families this morning that the blood of Jesus would cover them, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord would fill them, that their eyes would be open to your promises and to your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you to thrive in Christ, to be filled with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Him. Jesus is Lord this morning. Can we put our hands together? Oh, 
this morning we see you oh God as a redeemer and a healer and a deliverer this morning we appreciate you oh God on the cross for we understand Lord God but that by the cross you redeemed us from our sins and you gave us eternal life we appreciate your move in this place this morning that every life that is in this house oh God shall have an experience and an encounter with you father we give you praise that oh God on and on you keep on showing us your love your love is evident in our lives your love oh God is so sufficient for us thank you oh God that even this morning you impacting us our lives oh God in a new way thank you father we give you the praise and glory in Jesus mighty name can we put our hands together and shout a shout of praise in this house
dying for us king of glory thank you lord jesus that today we are remembering and the fact that you even reason we rose from the grave king of glory we just want to celebrate you king glory king of glory king jesus thank you father there is no one like you come on saints let us just worship the king of glory come on just lift up your hands to him he deserves all the praises
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind.
amazing grace. Can we sing it one more time? Unending love. Amazing grace. This is your love, oh God. Unending love. Amazing grace. Flowing in this place. Unending love. Amazing grace. Unending love. Give you the praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you,
Thank you so much for sending your son to go to the cross for us, to take every curse, to take every sin. Thank you for the power that you have, the love that you have. Thank you for your hope. Thank you that you see us and you say to us that you're worth it that you love us so much that you say you're worth it, that you would go to the cross for us in Jesus' name. Oh, my beautiful ones, how I love you. Church, oh church, pick up your cross and follow me. Let me fill you with my love and truth. Walk with me as you touch the lives of those around you. Church, there is no time like today to make disciples of man, to tell people the truth. Take my word and truth to those around you. Tell them, Church, for I am the Lord your God. Church, there is no other way to heaven but through me. Come to me, choose me, love me, and tell people the truth. I love you, my beautiful ones. I love you. Thank you for reminding us for what you did at the cross, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just bring ourselves to you, O oh God. We ask for forgiveness, O oh God, just for doing things on our own way. We choose to walk in your word, O oh Lord Jesus. We choose to be disciples of you, O oh King of glory, and reflect you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, this morning, O oh God, we just want to submit ourselves to you, to your ways, O oh King of glory. We repent, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
I'd like to welcome everybody, and I want to thank you for being with us as we come together and as we recognize the greatest sacrifice that could ever be made. We come together to worship the God who loves us so very, very much. And as we consider the events that led up to the crucifixion, on Sunday we were talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem into this great city. And then how he spends time through that week. He, he cleanses the temple. He teaches the disciples. He gives encouragement to his brethren. And then he has that meal, that Passover meal with his disciples. And Pastor Kevin on Wednesday evening just showed how even in the scriptures, the events and the way that the meal is taken is a, res- uh, a reflection of what God has done in order for us to be able to have the hope of salvation that is finally realized when Jesus dies on the cross. And so as we think about those things and we think about the events that take place after that, I'm going to read a section from the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to begin at verse 16. And it is a lengthy reading, but it really depicts the most important event in the history of humanity. It says, The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and he called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and twisted together crowns of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and they put on his own clothes. And they put those on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. And the written notice of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, the other on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults on him at him and shaking their heads, saying, So, you who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. And those who crucified him heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling to Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, and he put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood at the front of of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely... This man was the Son of God. 
I can't imagine what it would have been like for the centurion to be there, to see the progression. He is somebody who has executed crucifixions time and time before. He has seen people die in a whole lot of different ways, but he has never seen anybody die the way that this man Jesus died on that day. As you listen to the things that come out of his mouth and the concerns that are important to him, they are things that are fulfillment of Scripture, but also there is an attitude that cannot be explained. He's concerned about the well-being of his mother, and he looks to the disciple that he loves, to John, and he, he asks John to take care of his mom. But the most amazing thing would be when he says, Father, forgive these people because they do not know what they are doing. I think when we hear that, it's important to recognize that the reason for the crucifixion was the salvation of our souls. It was so that forgiveness would be possible, that Jesus wanted us to be forgiven of the sins that do terrible things to us. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But as we think about this, how that this cross, this instrument of torture, it's an instrument of shame and disgrace, how that becomes the emblem to symbolize the Christian faith and our relationship with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, as the Apostle Paul is talking about this to the Corinthian church, he says, We preach Christ crucified. It is a stumbling block to the Jews, and it is foolishness to the Gentiles. And as you think about that, how is it that it's a stumbling block to the Jews? For them to understand and believe and accept that God's Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, would die on a cross at the hand of the Roman soldiers is unfathomable. How could this possibly happen? And for the Greek people, they, they believe in a pantheon of gods and they believe in the power of the gods and the idea of a God who is killed by human beings just absolutely doesn't make sense. Or that a God would willingly die for His creation. That He would come to serve rather than to be served for the, for the Greek mind does not make sense. But we have to think of God's plan. We've got to try and understand why is it that God would consent to something like this or why would this even be a part of God's plan, God's plan conceived. When we look to the end of the Bible, we look to the picture that is painted there for us, the hope that God sets in front of us, it is one of reunion the joy, the absolute joy of God and humanity being united together in this amazing place where there is no struggle, there's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no dying. There is just absolute joy. It's a place of love. And as we think about love and the, all, all the different kinds of love that exist and that we've experienced and the ways in which love affects us, how sometimes we lose our minds just because we're in love, and we do silly and crazy things, how we're unable to concentrate on certain things and do certain tasks, or the sacrifices that we make when our children and our loved ones are in trouble, and the difficulties that they're experiencing, the extent that we would go to in order to help, comes out of love. And the thing about the love of God is that we're not able to understand that. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, to the Christians, the Ephesian Christians, he says, oh, one of my prayers for you is that you would have power, that God would give you the power to be able to understand how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God that surpasses understanding. That can't be understood. 
But I pray that somehow you could get a glimpse of this. And I firmly believe that when we look to the crucifixion event and we understand what is happening, that we at least have some sort of an idea of how much God loves us. See, as he looks to the relationship that's possible, the reunion, the joy of us and him together in heaven, and he looks at the cost, how much is this going to cost? And when he's writing, when Peter's writing, he says, it was not with perishable things like silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to you by your forefathers. But it was with the precious blood of Jesus, a lamb without blemish, nothing wrong, absolutely perfect. It was the precious blood, not just the blood, it was the life. It was Jesus giving his life in order for us to have salvation. As he looks to the joy that is in heaven for us, that God has prepared, stuff that I can't explain. It, it, it hasn't entered the mind of man. We, we can't explain the things that God has prepared for those who love him. When Jesus looks at that and he looks at the cost and he sees the crucifixion, he sees the pain and the agony, the horror of all of that. He realizes this is a high price to pray. I love what Pastor Kevin was saying earlier. He just looks at you and he says, it's worth it. It's worth it. You are worth it. He, he really desperately wants to have that communion, that relationship, and that experience with you forever. And so it's not something that took him by surprise. It was something that it was planned before time. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, He saved us. And He called us to a holy life. And it's not because of anything that we have done, but because of His own purpose and His grace. And this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus, get this, before the beginning of time. Again, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. He is a holy God, and in order for us to be with Him, we have to be blameless. We have to be holy. We have to be sinless in order for us to be able to be with Him in His presence. And so as we think about that and the holiness and the blamelessness that comes from what Jesus does for us on the cross, I don't want us to have a skewed understanding of the nature of God because there is an idea that exists that portrays God in a negative sense. And it looks something like this. It looks like God sending His reluctant Son, Jesus, to go into this world, to give up His privilege in heaven and to live on earth, to die for people who do not appreciate what He's doing for them, and many of whom don't even respond to the gift. And the reason for that is because sometimes people look to the prayer where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has called His closest disciples to be with Him, to watch and pray, and He moves off a distance. And as He prays about the ordeal that's ahead of Him, He thinks about what is involved in all of this. He said, Father, if it is possible, then let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And perhaps some people are interpreting this as, here's Jesus saying, Dad, please don't make me die for those people. But if you say that I have to, then I will. So it's important 
to have a good understanding of who Jesus is and what He represents to us. Throughout the history of humanity, God has been wanting us to understand who He is, His nature, and His love for us. And so, at different times, He has appeared to people in different ways. We remember the time when God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. Now, God is not a bush. God was just using a bush as a way to make His presence manifest. When the people of Israel were traveling through the wilderness, during the daytime, there was a cloud that signified the presence of God moved with them. At night, there was a pillar of fire. And God isn't a cloud, and God is not a pillar of fire. But these are manifestations of His presence. In Genesis chapter 18, you have an account where the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Abram when he was sitting at the trees of Mama. And then you, you read an account of three people having a conversation with them and to move off to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're saying that God is able to make His presence manifest in different ways, even as a human being. So John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And perhaps we're having a hard time understanding how something can be with someone and be that person as well. We've got to understand the Word as Jesus because in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says the Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. We saw His glory. It was the glory as the, the one and only, the, the begotten of the Father. And then he goes on to say that we, nobody has ever seen God at any time but the way that God is made known to us is through the Word. In Revelation, again, chapter 21, talks about, uh, uh, chapter 19, talks about Jesus being this Word of God. I want you to think about yourself for a moment and recognize that you're not your body, that your body is just a vehicle that transports you from place to place. There's going to come a time when, for all of us, this is just a fact of life, we die. When we die, when I die, somebody's going to put me into a box, and I'm not sure whether it's going to be buried underground or whether it's going to be burned in a furnace. I don't know, and I don't care, because that body is not me. The, the point of death is where spirit and body are separated. And, and there's another aspect to me. So spirit is the part of me that gives me life, that, that keeps my body alive. But there's another aspect. It's associated with my mind, and some people use the word psyche. Uh, that, that there was the Hebrew, the Greek people used the word suche to talk about this other aspect of the human that we call the soul. Twins behave differently. And you wonder what drives their behavior, and it's about this soul. The experiences that they have, the way that they relate to the world around them, the way in which they receive and give love, the, the personality and the character is encompassed in this soul. So you can put temptation in front of two different people and, one, and, and they'll each respond in different ways because they have different souls. They've got different personality, character, emotions and feelings. So there's three aspects to you. There's a body, a soul and a spirit. Wish that we could see that about the Almighty Heavenly Father. God is spirit. John 4 says, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. He is invisible. Nobody has ever seen Him. Nobody can see Him. But He is able to make His presence felt. The first thing that He wants us to understand about His nature is His personality. And so we see God perhaps as love. In John 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Let's love one another because love is from God. 
Everyone who loves has been born of God, knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. It's the epitome of who God is. But we also describe God as our heavenly Father. Because he's got that personality, the Father. When, when a Father is operating the way that God has designed Father to operate, there is provision, there is love, there is care, there's relationship, there's teaching. There are amazing aspects of that relationship that we have to associate with that word Father. And that's who God is. He's your heavenly Father. But in order to be able to relate to us, God is manifested as a human being that we call Jesus. But even before Jesus is born, there's this hint that He's more than what we're going to see and experience. In Isaiah 9, 6, He says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And you're going to call Him Wonderful Counselor. Maybe two words, Wonderful and Counselor. Mighty God. This child born to us, we're going to call Mighty God. We're going to call Him the Prince of Peace. And we're going to call the child, the baby, Everlasting Father. So that we understand that in the birth of Jesus, something incredible is happening, that Emmanuel, God is coming to be with us. He's going to tabernacle with us for a while to achieve the purpose that we have come together to celebrate today, the forgiveness of our souls. So in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 15, Paul is talking about Jesus and he says, the Son is the image. The Greek word there used is the word icon, the icon. The Son is the image, something that you can see, of the invisible God. Invisible is something that you cannot see. Yes, God is invisible, but, but he has an image, and Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And the text goes on to say that in verse 19, God was pleased to have His fullness in Jesus. And it's like saying it once isn't enough. In Colossians 2.9 it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God became a human being in order for us to be saved. And when you hear that prayer, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not your will, but my will be done. There is a takeaway that we need to, to have as we hear that. We see the crucifixion as the most horrorful, gory death that you can imagine. We need to understand that if there was another way in which sin could be forgiven, aside from the death of Jesus on the cross, salvation would have come that way. We need to know that there is no other way and there is no other name given among men by which we can be saved. It's only through Jesus that we can receive and achieve salvation. That's the big takeaway from that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. We also, though, need to look at the announcement of God's plan. Psalm 22 begins with these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is something written by David between 900 and 1,000 years before the event. David is writing these things down. And as you continue in the Psalm in 22, in verse 7 it says, All who see me mock me. They hurl their insults, shaking their heads. Verse 8 says, He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him. 
Verse 15 says, My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the earth. Verse 18 says, They divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garments. David probably didn't know what he was writing about. We just have the privilege of being able to look back, to read the psalm, to look at the event of what happened on that day that Jesus was crucified and put the two together and say God announced his plan beforehand. In Isaiah chapter 52, in verse 14, it says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, and I don't know what emotions you experience when you get a graphic image of what Jesus would have looked like after he had been brutally tortured. But it says, there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Verse 3 says, he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Verse 4, surely he took our pain. He bore our suffering and yet we considered him punished by God. Stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He like a lamb to the slaughter and the sheep before it shared his silence, he did not open his mouth. And he was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the throng, because... He poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressions. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressions. I'm saying this to say that hundreds and hundreds of years before the event, God had announced what was going to happen, and he showed in a mysterious way that he was going to take care of our sin situation and that the sin that we commit is going to be atoned. It's going to be taken care of by God himself. But even in his ministry, there was a time when a man by the name of Nicodemus came to see Jesus one night. And there were some things that Jesus told Nicodemus. Like he told him that if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. If you're not born of the water and the spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But he goes on in the conversation with Nicodemus. In verse 14 of John chapter 3, he says, Just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to think about that image. It says, Just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness and for some reason we're going to Say, this is a depiction of a future event, the crucifixion of Jesus. But we're not talking about a lamb that was put on the cross or a lion that was put on the cross. We're talking about a serpent that was put on a pole. And we're having a hard time with that.
but God executed his plan. He had a plan, and he executed that. In order for us to have some sort of idea why, why was it like this, we have to understand the gravity of sin. We, we, we live in a world that actually promotes sin. We live in a world where people advise their friends and relatives to go ahead and do sinful things because they believe that life is about receiving pleasure and as long as your sin is giving pleasure, that's okay. So sometimes we even try to dumb sin down or to tone it down, to make it sound a little bit more acceptable. And very often I find people who are talking about sin are saying, so there was this mistake that this person made or that person has got this uh, propensity to a kind of an illness or is not responsible for what he or she does. We, we have taken discipline away from parents. Parents are afraid to discipline their children and to set them straight because the world that we live in is trying to promote sin. We, it's almost as if they want children to behave in the worst possible way and parents feel totally powerless to do anything about it. We live in a world where children's, even their sexual identity is being questioned and parents are not allowed to say anything about that to encourage their children to live the way that God has designed for those children to live because the horror of sin has been taken away from society. We need to recognize that there are two kinds of consequences that result from sin that people commit. And the first are physical consequences. Now, the physical consequences will differ from sin to sin. Stealing a peanut is not, doesn't have the same physical consequences as murdering an individual. Very different consequences. But still, there is a problem when we do things that hurt ourselves and that hurt the people around us. Because God has created us to emulate His nature. We need to be people of love. He wants us to share the love that we receive from Him, that He pours into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that He's given us, to share that love with the people who are around us so that we can have a pleasant experience of life. That's the will of God for us, love of God. And sin destroys that. But then there are also spiritual consequences. And sometimes when we, when we try to get to understand that, we go down to the definition of what sin is. And we'll hear things like, well, sin is lawlessness, where you break the law. Or sin is missing the mark, where you don't quite get it right. Or sin is rebellion against God. I, I was reading one of R.C. Sproul's definitions of sin, and he was saying, sin is spiritual treason. It's almost like in the relationship that you have with God, God is saying, thou shalt not. And the human responds with, yes, I shall. Or God is saying, thou shalt. And the human response is, no, I won't. Who's going to make me? And, and, and there's this attitude that seems to be growing and it's becoming acceptable, but it's sin and it's, 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 it's defying God. And the consequences in spiritual terms, the consequences of that is death. So many of us, I might be bold enough to say all of us have had experiences with death. What we notice about that is that there are different levels of pain associated with death. When we hear that there have been floods in Malawi and people have lost their lives, we feel sad and then we turn off the news and we carry on with our meal because we didn't know those people. But when it's somebody close and when it's somebody that you love, the pain is unbearable. I want to use the word excruciating, but I don't think it's proper. That word excruciating means X out of so the cross. 
It's almost like being crucified. But maybe in a spiritual sense. Maybe that torment. I don't know if you've been to the funeral and you've seen that one person who was really, really close to the deceased. That person is just torn apart. And there's, a, there's a mourning and a pain, a, a cry that comes from deep, deep down in the person's soul because death is painful when you love. And when I talk about the love of God and I say we can't even understand how wide and how long and how deep and, and, and how high is this love of God, we will never be able to understand how hard it is for God to see a person dead in sin. Alive physically, walking around, but dead in sin. And it hurts. I think it hurts more than crucifixion. And here's why I think so. Because when there's an opportunity for God to bring back to life the sinner who's dead and the means is crucifixion, then he says, okay, I'll do it. I'll become a human being and I'll be crucified. I'll die on a cross so that that person can come back from death to life. That's the heart of God. That's the love that God has for you. I want you to say to your neighbor, God loves you. And so you've got in this the execution of the plan of God. We expect God to just forgive sins by grace. Grace is a free gift when you get something that you don't deserve. We call that grace. And, and, and this is what we're hoping for. We're, we're, we're saying sometimes God should just forgive people and get over it as a free gift. Or sometimes we appeal to mercy. Mercy is when you, you deserve something, punishment, and you don't get it. So you say, well, because God is gracious and because God is merciful, He should just arbitrarily forgive sins. We don't understand why there's a need for a crucifixion. The real need, the reason for the crucifixion is because of justice. God is a God of justice. And justice demands that when there is a breach of the law, that the consequences that have been prescribed are applied. We're fortunate that we have the opportunity to be in a covenant relationship with God. I say fortunate the difficult thing about covenant is when people drew covenants, what, there would always be blood associated with the covenants, uh, with the blood covenants. So whether they were cutting their hands and putting their bleeding hands together to say we're making a blood covenant, or whether they would cut an animal in two and let its blood flow and they walk through the blood, what they're really saying is if either one of us breaks this covenant, then blood needs to flow like this. And here we are in a blood covenant relationship with Jesus and we broke the covenant. But God is able to allow a system where rather than us be the ones to bleed and die, that He can take our place. And He shows this through prophecy all the way through the Old Testament where you're seeing the sacrifices. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But he is saying, yes, blood has to flow. Somebody has to die because the covenant is broken. But he is saying, I can take your place. I will take your place. And then he's going to say, we can accept it. And so, as we look to the fact that Jesus is innocent, I don't know if you've ever been innocent of something that you were charged of, and there's that sense of, I don't know, resentment or agitation or just disappointment that you've been falsely accused of something that you didn't do. I don't know if you've ever been through a trial that was just a mockery and, and you felt like there's prejudice, that, that the case was judged before you even went to trial. This was the situation of Jesus. But then they, they made it worse by bringing false witnesses in to testify against him and say things uh, that were just not right. I don't know if you've ever been whipped. To the point where the person whipping you actually draws blood. I don't know if you've ever been crowned with thorns. This isn't, this isn't something that we generally experience. 
but I know that we've all faced humiliation, being spat on or slapped or just being humiliated by people around us. But we've never been crucified and we don't understand what crucifixion is like. You know, the way that a person died when he was crucified, uh, when he was crucified generally was asphyxiation. So asphyxiation is where you can't breathe. So the way that our diaphragm works is that the lungs don't have muscles of their own. The diaphragm actually goes down and it draws air into our lungs and then we can push the air out and it's this muscle that we call the diaphragm that does that. But when you're suspended and you're hanging in a position where your hands are above your head, your diaphragm can't work effectively and can't bring enough oxygen into your lungs. So what the Romans used to do when they were getting tired and the, 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 the person on the cross was taking too long to die, then they would go and they would break the person's legs. Because what, what, what generally happened in the breathing process is the person would push up on these painful legs that have been pierced onto the cross. He'd push up and experience that pain just to be able to get some air into the lungs and then he'd go back down again. And it's a painful experience and his debating, should I experience the pain in my legs just to get air? So, but instinct, the, the natural desire to live just makes the person go through that painful ordeal one more time to get another breath into his lungs. That was a horrible way to die. But the prophecy about Jesus said that not a bone in his body would be broken and so when they came to him, he was already dead. He was already dead because many people who were crucified didn't even survive the whipping to be put onto the cross in the first place. People were whipped until even their vital organs could be seen. And I'm sorry if I'm terrorizing the little children and sensitive people, but I hope it helps us to understand the horror of sin. Sin is that bad, and, and, and we shouldn't take it lightly. We should, when we're making decisions about whether to willfully sin or not, we need to recognize that sin isn't about a walk in the park that makes you happy. Sin is something that has got serious and severe consequences. So let's go to the explanation of God's plan. And this is in... Leviticus chapter 16 verse 8 talks about what happened in Israel on the Day of Atonement. There was one day a year where the high priest signified uh, a situation where they'd get all of the sin of Israel and it would be just sent away from them. And so they would get two goats. In verse 8 of Leviticus chapter 16 it says, he is to cast lots for the two goats. One is for the Lord and the other is the scapegoat. And here's what happens to the scapegoat in verse 21. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all of their sins, and put them on the goat's head. And he shall send the goat away into the wilderness, into the care of someone who is appointed to the task. The goat will carry on itself all of the sins to a remote place, and then the man shall release it in the wilderness. And in a sense, Jesus, after the cross, taking the sins, will go into this place that we call Sheol in the Hebrew language, Hades in the Greek language, the, the area of death. He removes our sins away from us, really far, far away. As far as the east is from the west, he takes our sins away from us. In Hebrews chapter, eight, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, it says the Holy Spirit was showing by this way that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. It was an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and the sacrifices that were being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. Eternal regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not a part of this creation. And he did not enter by means of his own blood, 
uh, by means of the blood of bull, goats, and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. It was important for Jesus to become a human being and to share in our nature, to have that experience because he was dying on behalf of human beings. He was sinless. That qualified him to be an acceptable sacrifice. And he had the experiences of life that we have. In verse 15 of Hebrews 9, it says, For this reason, new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins that were committed under the first covenant. So he comes as a ransom to buy us back in a sense, to pay the price for the penalty of our sins. And that's just a phenomenal thought that we have been ransomed, that the price is paid. It's more than we can, more than we can afford, but God paid it for us. So let's look to this plan of God sealed. Jesus died. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, he says, Now we declare God's wisdom. It is a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before the beginning of time. And none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But they didn't understand it, and so they crucified him, and so the price, the ransom price for our salvation has been paid. In Hebrews 2, 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, it's talking about us, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and to free all Free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You do not need to be afraid of death anymore because Jesus has taken the sting out of it. Death for you is a change of address. You go from living on earth to living in heaven and it's just a great experience because of what Jesus has done for you. But you have to accept that. There's nothing worse than a parent paying a ransom for a child who's been kidnapped to be freed and then the child thinking, I'm not going home. <laughs> and especially when it broke the bank. And I don't know what your situation is like as you sit here today and you hear these wonderful things of how much God loves each and every one of us. How that our sin creates a problem and it puts us in a, a dead relationship with God. But the price for that, to undo that, has been paid. That we can actually be brought back to life. We can be given new birth through the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4, he says, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We're buried with them, therefore, by baptism. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may have newness of life. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life that I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. He wasn't crucified Calvary. He shared in the death of Jesus on the day that he was baptized. And he allows himself to be in Christ. And being in Christ, his sins are forgiven and he has the gift of eternal life. But salvation is by faith. You believe this message. That's, that's what gets you to accept the ransom. It's your faith. If you're online and you don't have this re relationship with God that you ought to have, life that Jesus makes available at an incredible expense, or if you're here and you don't have that relationship or you did and you're struggling with whether you want to live for God or whether you want to live for pleasure, now is an opportunity to change that. 
We're going to ask our ministry team to be in the prayer room for people who either want to give their lives to Jesus. And can I ask the worship team to come back at this time? So if you want to give your life to Jesus, or if you have given your life to Jesus and then you took it back and you realize that you're not doing so well with this and you want to dedicate, rededicate yourself to God, the opportunity for us to be able to do that is now. And as we think about this incredible gift of God, the forgiveness of our sins and the price at which that comes, I pray that as you think about that, and as you think about the snake on the pole, that there's a horrible thing that happens to Jesus. It's a thing that makes him perspire blood as he thinks about it. That when Jesus was on the cross, and the sin of humanity was on him. There's a transformation, a spiritual kind of transformation that took place there where responsibility for every vile, evil act that has ever been committed is personified in Jesus and it looks like a snake. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might be the righteousness of God. Can I ask you to stand up? I want you to celebrate your righteousness. I want you to know that Jesus had made you holy and blameless and righteous in His sight because He loves you. He loves you with a kind of love that no human being can explain. But He tries to explain it when He shows how He dies for you and willingly in order that you can spend eternity with Him in heaven. Please, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and the Savior of your life, please do come forward as we sing and as we worship.
Father, thank you for sending your Son to pay the price for our sin, that he absorbed our sin into his body. He took all our sin. And so darkness covered the face of the earth. But Lord, you ripped the veil. You tore it from the top to the bottom. And you opened the Holy of Holies that every one of us, covered by your blood, would be able to walk into your presence and be washed by your blood so that your blood would make us blameless, that your blood would allow us to be holy, that your blood would give us your spirit, your mind of Christ. And we give you thanks for the price you paid. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I ask you just to be seated for a moment and as we take Holy Communion together, just remembering that Jesus, Jesus himself today is symbolized as taking our sin and we would be remiss, I believe, if we didn't identify with that this morning. And so you've got the communion elements before you. And Paul says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night he was betrayed, on the night of Passover when he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Just as we pause before we take this bread of life together, we recognize and remember Jesus was physically offering his body to the disciples, to you and I. And he says, this is my body. And so as we partake of this, we partake of the Lord's body, the symbolism of the Lord's body, that the bread of life would fill us, that his faith, his hope, and his love would fill us today. If you could take out the bread... And Father, we come before you and we thank you for your body that's gone to the cross for us. The bread of life. That we could eat from the bread of life, the word. From every word that proceeds from the Father's mouth. We partake today in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, knowing he would shed his blood. This do as often as you drink it as in remembrance of me. And so Father, we thank you for the blood, the blood of the lamb that was shed to wash our past, to give us a future that we would be blameless in Christ because of your blood, not by our works, but because of your grace and because of your mercy, we drink today together in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus looked at the cross and he looks back to you today and he says, you are worth it. Can I ask you to tell your neighbor, you are worth it. Let's stand before the Lord. Can you say to your neighbor, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. Be blessed. Amen.